Indy 500 Films presents The Legends of the Brickyard. Perhaps no other single sporting event in the world provides more international flavor than the Indianapolis 500, and certainly no year favored more foreign dominance than 1987. Hi, everyone. I'm Bob Jenkins. And I'm Larry Newber. For the first time in the history of this Memorial Day Classic, not a single car entered was built in the United States. But no driver made more headlines throughout the month than Italian Mario Andretti. But when all was said and done, a familiar racing name as American as apple pie and baseball captured a record-tying victory after one of the most bizarre finishes in history. So as we continue our series, Legends of the Brickyard, we present the 1987 Indianapolis 500, a month when the have-nots ended up with all of it by the end of the month. The challenge has changed very little with the passage of time. It is a personal challenge, a test of nerves total commitment of guts and courage. It is a lonely world each man enters, accepting his own limitations, defying danger, allowing no room for doubt. For the 71st time, it continues as the greatest spectacle in racing history, the Indianapolis 500. To the brave and courageous who endure, it is the ultimate quest for excellence. For nearly the entire month of May, the quest for excellence at Indianapolis is all-consuming. The team is the foundation of this search for superiority. And 15-hour days are as normal as the tension that surrounds them. It is officially called practice, but it is so much more. It is adjusting, refining, tuning, discovering, communicating, and driving. And then doing it again and again and again. It is these long, pressure-filled days in May where no detail is overlooked and potential winners are born. But first, they must avoid trouble. Then, they must qualify. All the hours of tuning and testing are vital as defending champion Bobby Rahal chases the checkered flag on this windy first day of qualification. Ray Hall escapes possible difficulty as he plays road tag with a wind-blown beach ball. The speed of 213 miles an hour reserves a berth on the front row, where he will start alongside the month's hottest driver. From the opening day of practice, the most dominant machine on the speedway is the Lola Chevrolet of Mario Andretti. Nearly every day of practice, his speed is some three or four miles an hour faster than any other driver. Now, he will challenge a boiling hot sun, swirling winds, and a dry track made slippery by excessive rubber in his quest for the day's biggest prize, the pole position. Second only to A.J. Foyt in total IndyCar triumphs, Andretti captures his third 500 pole, calling his four-lap struggle with the elements the most nerve-wracking of my 22 years at the Speedway. As May takes on the appearance of Mario's month, the elements begin to extract their toll. Turning navigation of the 78-year-old brickyard into not only a game of chance, but a game of risk. The biggest thing has been that we've had no rain. 
with all the heat, uh, the rubber and oil down on the track has made the track quite a bit slipperier than in years past where it's been washed away, uh, you know, during the week by just rainstorms. And uh, that and coupled with the wind is probably, and, the, and people having the problems with the tires has made it all that little bit more slippery for everybody. But the thing you have to remember that the track's the same for, for everybody. So if it's slippery for one, everybody's got the same situation. is seriously injured, struggling with the elements. But only 11 cars qualify on pole day, the fewest in more than 20 years. Two-time winner Rick Mears puts himself in the front row for an unprecedented seventh time in 10 starts. Others who make the show for this richest race in the world are Dick Simon, the oldest starter at 53. Two-time world champion Emerson Fittipaldi. Roberto Guerrero, with top four finishes the past three years. And the year's first rookie to qualify, Ludwig Heimrath Jr. One of the most incredible streaks in the history of any sport is on the line as A.J. Foyt searches for a 30th consecutive start in this ultimate run for glory. Having driven more miles and led more races than any other driver at Indy, Foyt is hoping to win a fifth 500 championship. The most popular and successful driver in the history of American racing, Foyt earns a start on the inside of the second row at more than 210 miles an hour. The success of Foyt and all the other attempted qualifiers is flashed around the track on 15 modern electronic message boards, the latest addition to the greatest speedway in the world. After two days of qualifying, what had been predicted to be a record-breaking carnival of speed turned into an excursion into the unknown. Veteran drivers prove better able to cope with the unpredictable elements and former champions occupy the top four starting positions for the first time in history. In capturing his third pole position here at Indianapolis, Andretti earned another notch in the record books, this time for having the longest span between poles, 20 years. Meanwhile, the oldest man to ever run here, 53-year-old Dick Simon, enjoyed his first start ever in the top three rows by qualifying six fastest in his 16th start. Car owner Roger Penske, the month of May is both bitter and sweet. He qualifies two cars, but a wall banger by Danny Ungaius will affect his month more than any other single event. When Ungaius is ruled medically unable to drive, recovering from a concussion, Penske is without a pilot for his third car. He quickly consummates a deal with three-time winner Al Unser, who had come to Indy without a ride for the first time in 23 visits. The all-time leading money winner in 500 history, Unser has finished second, third, fourth, and fifth in four of his last five Indy starts. He is one of seven three-time winners, finishing first in 70, 71, and 78. With Penske looking for a record sixth Indy victory as a car owner and Unser, a race-savvy veteran behind the wheel, this team will give some of the favorites a scare. With Unser safely qualified in the middle of the seventh row, Penske has decided to pull Danny Sullivan from the starting grid to re-qualify with a different chassis. It's a gamble that gives the 1985 champion a quicker machine and a better chance to win. The second weekend of time trials also focuses on the goals of veteran Gordon Johncock, returning to the Indy Wars after two years of retirement. The first thing is get in the race, you know, have a safe qualifying speed, not go out there and, 
and have to extend yourself so far that uh, you're going to end up in a wall or spin or something uh, because if you do that it's probably at this stage of the game it's too late on the second weekend if you wreck a car and you don't have a, a good backup car that you haven't run and if you put it in the fence uh, you're out of the race the two-time 500 winner puts himself in the race without incident a much better month than tom sneva experiences twice kissing the wall before qualifying 22nd Rookie Davy Jones has been racing for 17 of his 22 years. In a car adjusted by owner A.J. Hoyt, Jones qualifies the 10th fastest machine in the field and is the swiftest rookie. With 33 road warriors on the totem pole and time running out, there are still more in line, determined to conquer the world's most demanding racetrack. The center of attention becomes a rookie named Dominic Dobson, who is on the bubble, the first man to be eliminated if his speed is topped. Dobson can do nothing but wait, and watch, and worry. With just 34 minutes until qualifying is complete, Steve Chassie becomes Dobson's tormentor, aiming to replace him in the field. Happy team watches Chassis bump Dobson for spot number 33. But later, Chassis finds himself on the bubble. Chassis speed holds up, and the grid is complete for the 71st running of the late Tony Holman's dream come true, the Indianapolis 500. Covered by more photojournalists than any other annual sporting event in the world, the 500 has provided a month of action, thrills, and excitement. They have photographed 21 separate accidents, more than the grand total of the previous two years. Now, before race day, they have one final event to witness, a unique pit crew contest featuring the teams of Roberto Guerrero, A.J. Foyt, Mario Andretti, and Bobby Rahal. So, drop the green and gun the machine. Then, over the wall in no time at all. Scramble and tumble, but don't ever fumble. And give first prize to the Andretti guys. Well, what would a year in Indianapolis be without some sort of record by A.J. Foyt? In 1987, he became the first car owner to ever start four cars in the same 500 twice. The other time was 1970. Interestingly, Foyt and two of his former teammates combined for a total of 11 Indianapolis 500 victories between them. The other two men, Alanzer Sr. and Johnny Rutherford. the traditional command is the chairman of the board of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Mrs. Mary F. Hallman. Gentlemen, start your engines. Mrs. Tony Hallman is the command. For the 71st time in auto racing history, the most spectacular and dramatic moment in all sports. 33 cars rumbling with expectation in front of an estimated 400,000 excited fans and roaring wheel to wheel into turn one. Bull sitter Mario Andretti escapes the path 
and avoids what could have been a major problem. A spin in the first turn puts drivers under caution, but does not seriously affect any of the pre-race favorites. For most of the early going, the fiery red rocket of Andretti seems to be in a race of its own, untouchable. Proving Mario correct when he called it the best car I've ever had here. But the question remains, will the man who has finished only three of these spectaculars since winning it in 1969 Mario end his jinx? Will Mario's indie luck finally improve? No problems at all for Mario Andretti. For 150 laps, some 30 drivers become the hunters. Andretti, the hunted. It is the most awesome and challenging test of precision in all of sports. And in 1987, nerves are at the breaking point and the rate of attrition is soaring. Roberto Guerrero barely avoided a major incident when he hit that loose wheel from Tony Bettenhausen's car. Tragically, a spectator in turn three was not so fortunate. He was struck and killed by that errant tire. That marked the first time since 1938 that a non-participant was killed in a race-related incident. Kogan, Ray Hall, Foyt, Sneva, John Cock, Mir, among the many drivers all out of the race under 150 laps. I came in the pits because I had a CV joint break in the rear, so I figured our day was over anyway. Uh, it was just uh, an ignition problem. Uh, it, it happened really uh, after our first stop. I feel it, you know, if the engine would have stayed together, you know, we'd have been around at the end with a hearty special. And I think anybody that's around at the end today is going to be in the top ten, maybe the top five. <laughs> then, with less than 25 laps till the checkered flag, disappointment again bites Mario Andretti. A fuel system failure floods the engine. Slowly and painfully, Mario's masterful month grinds to a halt. For 22 days and 177 laps, Mario Andretti has been unchallenged. But after an impossibly long pit stop, the problems take their toll and the red number five is in serious trouble. But is still able to continue racing. Surging into the lead is Roberto Guerrero, 20 laps away from the biggest triumph of his career. His wife Katie knows with Andretti having lost time in the pit and many of the favorites in the garage, Roberto is driving the fastest car on the speedway. Guerrero is flying. Make no mistake about it. Guerrero is flying. But on lap 182, fate frowns on the 28-year-old driver from Colombia. As Guerrero receives fuel, he knows his closest competitor, Al Unzer, is a lap behind. But he also knows he has a problem. He cannot take his car out of gear. engine dies, Danny Sullivan encourages Penske teammate Unzer as the problems in the leader's pit multiply. When Guerrero's crew hurriedly tries to push him out, their attempt is futile. And looking much like visitors from another planet, they frantically race after the now lifeless car. While Guerrero loses valuable time, Unzer rockets into the lead. finally rolled out, 
He is passed and then left by the yellow blur of Al Unser. And Guerrero is back in action. But, but your race leader is Al Unser. The man who was unemployed when he came here in early May is sitting out front, a full lap ahead of Guerrero. As Guerrero battles back to pass under and join the lead lap, it seems unimportant. Until suddenly, with but eight laps to go, Andretti's injured machine limps to a halt, bringing out the yellow flag and allowing the trailing cars to bunch up behind Al Unzer for a restart. Given the opportunity, Guerrero tries his best to overtake the six lap cars between himself and the leader. Bettenhaus, Rutherford, Al Unzer Jr., Barbaza all fall to Guerrero. But can he reel in the big one? remains. Less than five seconds separate Guerrero from the Penske car. It is, however, too much to overcome. And Al Unser Sr., after starting in 20th position, roars to the checkered flag. With his victory, Unser now joins A.J. Foyt as the only four-time winners of this greatest of all racing events. I tell you, it's hard to put in words. It, uh, it's just a great, great feeling. Uh, uh, I'm sitting in the car and I, I tell myself I can't believe this is really happening today. And it, between everything, I, I think this one is, is a lot more gratifying because of, of the circumstances that are occurred during the during the month but yet uh it's just a great feeling to be able to win but uh, i think this one's harder and, and nicer when this quest for excellence is over guerrero finishes second rookie of the year fabrizio barbaza third and allinger jr fourth but the triumph and the tributes of 1987 belong to al unzer at 48 the oldest indie winner and proud victor of this the 71st Indianapolis 500. I guess you could say that Al Unser set some sort of record for acquiring the highest paying job from the unemployment line. He did break his brother Bobby's record though in becoming the oldest man to win the 500 just four days short of his 48th birthday. And when Unser led that all important 200th lap, he tied Ralph De Palma's record of 613 laps led here at Indy in his career. De Palma had held that record since 1912. And another record that has stood almost as long is Harry Hart's fifth straight top four finish in his first five appearances from 1922 to 27. Roberto Guerrero was hotly in pursuit of that record, capturing his fourth such finish in 1987. But Guerrero hopes to be slightly more successful than Hart's, who never captured that top spot. Well, from the front to the back, don't feel too bad for 33rd place finisher George Schneider. Ziggy picked up almost $93,000, and that's the most money ever earned by someone who never completed a single lap. Meanwhile, Snyder's perennial teammate, A.J. Foyt, in his record 30th consecutive start, has competed against a record 216 drivers here in Indianapolis. By contrast, 202 drivers have only started here once, and somehow I don't think we're through hearing from A.J. yet. I'm Bob Jenkins. And I'm Larry Newber. We hope you have enjoyed that heart-stopping 1987 Indianapolis 500, but just another in our series, Legends of the Brickyard.